And Mrs. Palmore did a great job. She wrote that for this service, by the way, and I appreciate her using her talents that God has given her to be able to put words on paper and be able to relate those through way of song. And what a blessing, what a blessing that is. Take your Bible and go back, if you will, please. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 21, where the Bible says, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. I, I want to speak this morning on God shed his grace on thee. You know, here we see that God is talking about his mercies. We understand the difference between mercy and grace, as I'll define again in just a few short minutes. But here we see in verse 22, where the Bible says that it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. Verse 23, the Bible says, they are new every morning. Great, it says, is thy faithfulness. And so the Bible explains how great his faithfulness is in giving us his mercy, uh, withholding that which is rightful judgment upon. But yet his mercies, because they are extended every morning, because his compassions fail not, we understand that you and I are not consumed. We think about our nation, of course, on Tuesday, celebrating 241 wonderful years. On July the 4th, 1776, there was 56 brave men that entered into a room and signed a document known as the Declaration of Independence. Five of those were captured and tortured by those that was the British and put to death. Twelve of those lost their homes and wound up having them uh, ramshacked and all sorts of things burnt down to the ground and lost their homes completely. Uh, two of those lost their sons in the war. One of those lost two sons that was captured and later killed. Nine of them found themselves so wounded themselves by the hardships of war that they also died. There was a man by the name of Carter Braxton, Virginia, very wealthy man. He was a trader. He also was a planter of the field. And they said that he had ships that he would take and put his merchandise on and be able to ship them across the sea. Uh, the British Navy sank all of his ships. And later on, he did his best to pay off his debts as he sold and liquidated everything that he had and wound up dying in rags. There was Thomas, uh, Thomas McKean. Thomas McKean uh, was uh, hounded, if you will, by the British army and was forced to move out of his house later on because he had such a refined house and he was a very wealthy man, but later on because of his refined house and it was so very, very big, uh, they took up, the British did, uh, a place of command. It was called a command center. And he turned to George Washington, that was his personal friend, and said, I'll pay any debt just go ahead and destroy the whole thing. And so they blew up the house uh, that he lived in for many, many years. He also died a very poor man. There was Thomas Nelson's home. Thomas Nelson's home was saged by the British. Of course, he lived in Yorktown, and it was saged by the British and also was blown up later on as he uh, it was a command center. And he turned to Washington and asked the very same thing. He died a bankruptcy uh, later on in his life and died a pauper. There was a great price that was paid for the freedom that you and I enjoy today. It was not something that was just, uh, well, I think we'll just stand up and just walk away and we'll proclaim ourselves free. No, people laid down their blood. People paid a dear price so that you and I can have the liberties and the freedom. I'm very pleased that uh, the governor of Kentucky now uh, has stated and the Congress of Kentucky and whatnot has signed it into law that uh, starting in the fall, the Bible would be brought back into all the public schools in Kentucky and it'd be the very first state that brings the Bible back into the state uh, of their uh, place there in the public schools. I'm very pleased to be able to announce that. And so many other things are turning uh, here in the United States. And I would like to say it's about time but uh, let's not just take it for granted. Uh, let's not be the ones that look at it and say, well, I tell you what, things are going to surge upward. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, there's still a great fight that is waging to be able to preserve the liberties that you and I now enjoy here in the United States of America. There's still the spirit, however, of independence as we celebrate that which God had given us to be able to have the liberties that God would have us to have. Uh, but there's still a fight. Oh, there's a fight, as you see, of uh, God being kicked out of uh, most of that which is the public institutions that you find around America. 
Abortion, of course, on demand has become something that's very popular over the years. And uh, so many other things, the legalizing of drugs and pornography, uh, whereby a person can get it with the available touch. And the U.S. District Court ruled at one time with the cabinet members that even at West Point, no longer would the young men be uh, under that which is a demand and be made to go to that which is the chapel services. The first constitutional, if you would please, uh, convention as it was held, uh, the men were so, so distraught. They didn't know what to do. It just seemed like that uh, everywhere that they turned, uh, that everybody seemingly by great masses was against them. Uh, there was a gray haired, white, snowy uh, type haired man in certain areas of his head that stood. Matter of fact, he was the oldest man uh, that signed the Declaration of Independence. He was in his 70s. His name was Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin rose and he said, gentlemen, he said, uh, true, this is uh, not one single petal, if you remember, will fall to that which is the ground, escaping God's attention. And if God so gave attention to the single petal that would fall to the ground, would he not also care for a nation that is in such upheaval? He says, let us therefore uh, determine that we're going to seek his face. And at the saying of that, all those men in that room, in that chamber that day, fell to their knees and they started to pray. And then out of that, uh, they chanted as they came up from their knees, a uh, one out of many. Now, can I tell you that these men sought the face of God they sought the face of God because they wanted God to do something. And can I tell you, the Bible says over in Psalm 33 and in verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The Bible says the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. And so God has chosen the people. And by the way, I believe that we are a part of that people that God has chosen. Yeah. It's from America that you see many, many missionaries as I travel the world and preach in different countries that you see many missionaries that have been sent. And they're sent from America, a, a place where the word of God has been cherished all these many years. And by the way, a Christian nation as it was founded, uh, where God uh, sent his grace to that which is the culture. But yet the culture now is failing because we've set aside biblical principles. You think about Greece. Greece was uh, uh, a civilization that was built on its own culture, but Greece failed. You think about Rome. Rome was the civilization that was built upon its own power, but it failed. But here you have a country that was built upon uh, that which is biblical principles uh, at the Valley Forge where there was the, the kneeling of a single individual by the name of George Washington that prayed and sought the face of God. As uh, they would open up Congress and still do today in prayer. Can I tell you, there needs to be a nation that realizes that God is the one that has blessed the nation. Why? Because it was founded upon biblical principles. Blessed, the Bible says, is the nation whose God is the Lord. And as long as we keep God as our Lord. I, I hear about uh, different ones that they'll, they'll put up the Ten Commandments and somebody will come along with a car and they'll run it over. Oh, but that doesn't stop. They'll put up another Ten Commandments and then they'll put up another Ten Commandments. And there, there's the resolve of saying, we're going to get the Word of God out. Now, may I say this? Don't be left behind when it comes to you doing your part in getting the Word of God out. You, you don't be left behind. And you decide, as a young person, you'll do your best. Uh, yesterday, I think that we reported in, uh, total reports I got so far, 190 people uh, bowing their heart as we had Operation Saturation and receiving Christ as their Savior, as people went out soul winning all day long. Now, can I tell you, that, that's a wonderful, remarkable thing. Why is that, preacher? Because when they receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, God changes them from the inside out. Thank God for every little boy and every little girl that bowed their heart yesterday and received Christ as Savior. Thank God for every teenager that bowed their heart yesterday and received Christ as Savior. Thank God for every adult, no matter what age, that bowed their heart yesterday and received Christ as Savior. Now, can I tell you, that is what's going to keep America strong. It's not the fact of who's in the White House. It's who's in the church house. It's what God is doing in the hearts and in the lives of those that are saved and how God can change somebody.
somebody from the inside out. America was established on such principles. America has been greatly blessed by God. Uh, there's not a nation in all the world that I have ever been in that has been so blessed by God. We have the natural resources here. We have the natural beauty here. My, if you just travel Texas alone, uh, Texas is like its own little world. I mean, you travel and they've got the, uh, the ocean and you go to another part and they've got the, uh, the mountainous areas and you go to another part and it's the sandy dunes and you go to another part and it's, uh, or, or, or uh, by the way, no matter where you go in Texas, when you go there in the summertime, it's always hot. It don't matter. But, uh, but, but can I say, uh, America, America has natural beauty. Uh, we have a good government, not the best government uh, that we've had over the years, but we have a good government that is better than any other government around the world. All right, And we can thank God for that. We can thank God we don't have the concentration camps as they had in Phnom Penh. And we can thank God that there is no secret police that's going about arresting people because they stand for that which is their God and truth. We can thank God that there is no one-man rule of dictatorship inside of our country. We can thank God there is free speech and free press to be able to get out that which is gospel literature and other literatures as well. We can thank God for the religious freedoms that we have where there's no state-run church. And uh, by the way, that's what that document was all about uh, that uh, uh, with the separation of church and state that I'll speak on tonight. But can I tell you, uh, we can thank God that there's a place where you can become everything that God wants you to become. Uh, Thomas Edison, by the way, was in the United States, not in some other country. Uh, uh, you think about Henry Ford in the United States, not in some other country, had the freedom to be able to use their imagination, to be able to create things, to be able to help humanity because there was the freedom to be able to do so and was able to do so right here on the land of the United States of America. America, I believe this, America was established as one nation under God. But can I tell you, it needs to stay one nation under God. A 14-year-old uh, child uh, was given the Gospel of John just recently and said, what is this? And the, the soul winner said, well, this is a Bible. And he said, what's a Bible? Now, by the way, that's here in Texas. You say, but Texas is the Bible Belt. I have often said what Dr. May told me when he was uh, trying to uh, talk to me about coming. Uh, he said, it may be the Bible Belt, but we've lost our buckle. And it's true. Uh, you know, you go soul winning here, and we have so many different uh, places. By the way, uh, they, they just said that uh, 89,000 jobs just opened up last week in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. 89,000 jobs in one week opened up. Oh, you said, but preacher, I can't find a job. Well, maybe you're not looking in the right place. But can I tell you, listen, uh, America has been so blessed. America has been blessed because we have Christian principles. America has been blessed because of the government that we've been able to set up that has not been something where the government was set up to regulate the people, but the government was set up to be regulated by the people. Uh, you know, and we have a nation, one nation under God that God so wants to bless, but yet it's a nation that doesn't understand its foundation. It's a nation whereby uh, when they took the Bible out uh, of the school, uh, you know, when they took it out, uh, what can I tell you? They took out the very foundation. No wonder we have what we have today. Uh, because the Bible says that God's people, yes, it says God's people, will be destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, a person that's one of God's kids can be destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, uh, I, I thank God that we have a Christian school. I do. I thank God. Now, by the way, there's Christian school teachers that teach in the public school, and I thank God for them. We have several that's in our church that teach in the public school, and they do an outstanding job in teaching in the public school. And I thank God for every single one of them. But can I tell you, uh, we need to continue to have the liberties of teaching the principles of the Word of God in our educational systems. And in order to be able to do that, we have to understand that God has to be involved. So what can I do? What can I do? The Bible says that you're the salt of the earth. The Bible says that you're a light that's on a hill that needs not to be hid. So what do I do? Here's what I do. I try to live for God all the days of my life. I try to be that light on that hill. I try to be that salt, if you would please, in the earth. 
I tried to be that one that has a testimony. I've said often, you ought to use more Christian words than not. Use words like praise the Lord. Use words like hallelujah that's not common to that which is usual speech. And uh, call somebody, provoke somebody to be able to think on those things that God has placed in front of them. Help them to be able to think. We need to be a nation. The Bible talks about how we're supposed to pray without ceasing. We need to be a nation that decides that we're going to pray. I mean pray. I mean take time to pray. When you have to eat today, uh, uh, stretch your hands across the table and grab your wife's hands and, and uh, let people see that you're going to pray. Don't pray just a short little prayer. Don't pray, uh, dear God, bless the food. Oh, take your time and pray. Take your time and pray. Oh, you say, preacher, I don't want to draw the attention of anyone. Why not? That's what the world does. Now, I'm not saying do it for display, but somebody needs to let other people know that somebody is praying. The other day I was in a restaurant and I was walking out and here was uh, two younger people, two younger people, and they were praying for their food. And I stopped and I said, look, I just want to tell you, I appreciate you so much. Uh, thank you so much for not being ashamed of your God in public. Thank you so much for that. You know, uh, it does make an impression. It does cause people to think. It does provoke other people to that which is action. Boy, I don't know about you, but I, I've got dreams for America, just like I have dreams for my family. I'm so glad Rebecca's back visiting with us for a couple of uh, days. I'm so glad that we're able to spend time together. But I want America to be great for her and for my sons and their wives and our grandchildren. The same type of America that I grew up in where I could have the freedom to be able to serve God and the freedom to be able to worship God and the freedom to be able to live for God all the days of my life, I so want that for my children and for my grandchildren. Well, how is it that we can have such? Well, I have dreams. I have dreams that one day we'll turn the bill of abortion around. I have dreams. I have dreams one day that Congress, in the Congress Hall, uh, there will be singing of praises to God. I do have such dreams. I have dreams that one day our society will be a society that will welcome back that which is traditional marriage as the way of life and not something that will be ostracized by a small select group. I have dreams that uh, instead of pornography, there will be child protection. I have dreams that God will work in people's lives. Now, how do we get that? Let me give you some statements. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, if you will. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. The Bible says, but God, who is rich in mercy, God who is rich in mercy, the Bible says, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by, it says, grace are you saved. Now, here's what we understand. We understand we need grace. Grace is mentioned 159 times in your Bible, and we need grace. We need grace. What is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is God's unearned favor, if you will please, uh, for humanity. Now, we need that grace. I, I don't get to go to heaven because I'm good. I don't get to go to heaven because I've been baptized. I don't get to go to heaven because I attend some type of religious gathering called a church. I don't get to go to heaven because my mom or my dad was religious. I don't get to go to heaven because I keep one of the seven sacraments or one of the Ten Commandments. No, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. We ought to be able to take the grace of God and be able to show others their need of understanding and accepting God's Grace. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 9, the Bible says, not by works, lest any man should boast. The Bible talks about how this is not just for us, but this is for all ages. Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 7, the Bible says, uh, in the ages it says to come, he might show exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness, it says, towards us through Jesus Christ. And so I can have the very grace of God that's operating inside of me. And can I tell you, sometimes I have to pray for extra grace. I do. I say, God, would you please help me? Lord, I I'm getting ready to deal with somebody. I'm getting ready to help somebody. And God, I tell you what, whoo, God, I want you to give me some extra grace. I need some extra grace to be able to say what is right. And uh, I don't want you uh, to uh, let my mind wander, uh, but I want to be able to help them, and I need extra grace in order to do it. Now, can I tell you, uh, God's grace is sufficient. Amen. 
It really is. Uh, he gave you enough grace to be saved, dear friend, and he'll give you enough grace to be able to keep you saved, but yet you ought to walk in his grace every single day of your life. And ask God to help you. Don't be short-tempered with people. Be long-suffering with people. Uh, be forgiving of people. Uh, extend that hand, if you would please, a blessing as God has so extended his hand, a blessing uh, to you. And you decide that you'll be that one that will be full of grace. Full of grace, giving that which is unmerited favor to those that do not deserve it. The Bible says here in Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 7, it says, through Jesus Christ. Now, I can't do it any other way except through Jesus Christ. By the way, this will help you. This will help you before you chew out your wife, before you chew out your husband, before you become short-tempered with that which is a child. Maybe you ought to go to God and say, God, listen, you have bestowed your grace on our country. You have been good to America. You've been good to every citizen that's here in America. You have not uh, been the one that's withheld your blessing, but you have blessed. And so, God, I'm asking you to help me, if you would, with my wife or with my uh, uh, husband or with my child or with my in-laws or with my outlaws. I, I'm praying that you will help me and ask God for his grace. By the way, uh, we have not because we ask not. Yes. You say, I've got marriage problems. Well, have you gone to him? Oh, but I've got child-rearing problems. But have you gone to him? Uh, but I've got uh, challenges beyond compare. Have you gone to him? I think so many times, here's what we do, dear friend. Uh, we decide that we want to take it all upon ourselves, and we want to handle it ourselves. Yes. You cannot handle it yourself. Uh, you've already tried that. Let me ask you, how's that working for you? You know, most of the time it's not working for you. You know, because you want to take control. You want to take, uh, if you would, and by the way, most of the time we want to take control. We also want to take credit. But what about God? Could not God be the one that would help us? I'm saying that we need continual grace in our lives. Uh, you think about the freedoms that we have here in America. You think about the land uh, flowing, if you would please, likened onto the land promised to the Israelites of milk and honey. You think about a rich land. You think about a full land. You think about an abundance land, if you will. And God has given that very thing to us. But if we're not careful, we can turn against him. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, the Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man out of the earth, and it grieved, it says, him at his heart. And can I tell you, uh, uh, but there was one, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8, the Bible says, uh, Noah found grace, that's favor, that's favor, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Can I tell you, out of all the nations, all over the world, there's one nation that has found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, why is that? Because we were known as a nation of righteousness. We were known as a nation, if you would please, where the Bible was the center book of all books. We were known as a nation that uh, would take and lift up the name of God. It was Samuel, Samuel Adams. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He said, first of all, he says, I rely on the merits of Jesus Christ for the pardon of all my sins. Patrick Henry said this. He said, uh, this of all inheritance, he says, I give to my dear family, uh, which leaves them poor, but in Jesus Christ I serve, and I can give them an inheritance that is far above all riches. It was John Quincy Adams that said this. He said, my hopes of the future is that it is founded upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I, I cannot uh, quabble uh, over anything knowing my godly heritage. George Warson said this. He says, uh, uh, we would do well if above all else we leave not out the religion of Jesus Christ. It was John Broom. He was a signer of the Constitution. Uh, he wrote his son one day, and he said, Do not forget to always be a Christian. Now, can I tell you, we can bear the name of Christ, but sometimes we don't act like we are Christian. And so what do we do? We give that which is grace. 
We also give that which is mercy. Think about this and I'm done. Mercy literally means this. It means compassion or love. So God wants us to have that which is mercy. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. Now, wait a minute. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, wait a minute. Uh, we deserve to have the wages of sin, but God, through his gift, his gift of what? His gift of mercy, he withheld that judgment yeah. that we rightfully deserve. And can I tell you, I've seen America change. I've been preaching for 34 years, and over the last 10 years... I've seen America drastically change. Used to be when, uh, uh, yes, even in our country, and I preached in several foreign countries, and it still is that way there, but even in our country, uh, uh, there would be a, a respect in just a general fashion of those that were men of God. Oh, but that has since long been gone. You know, there used to be a great respect for the Bible, but now as you take the Bible and you talk to people, people have a disregard for the Bible. Now, can I tell you, America has changed. But the same way that America has changed over the past 10 or 20 years is the same way America could change again. I was talking to an older preacher. I was preaching in a conference, and I was talking to an older preacher, and I just finished my preaching. And, uh, and he said, so you're one of these guys that really do believe that America could have revival again? And I said, I'm one of those guys. And I really do believe that America could have revival again. You see, because God's not dead. You see, because the Holy Ghost is still alive. And because uh, God can work in man. You know, I'm excited when our young men stand up and they serve God. And I'm excited when our old men stand up and serve God. I'm excited when our young ladies stand up and serve God. And I'm excited when our older ladies stand up and serve God. Now, can I tell you, it's exciting to be able to see people that love God enough to be able to make statements when they're, with their life. Now, why is it we can make statements with our life? Because of the grace of God. I'm going to be able to go to heaven because of the good grace of God, unmerited favor. But I'm able uh, to escape that which is the fires of hell because the mercy of God endured forever. And because His mercy endured forever, there is Him withholding the judgment that I rightfully deserve. And can I tell you, America is great today, not because of the presidents and not because of those that are in the White House and not because of those that grace the calls of Congress, but because of the God of the United States of America. May it always be true where the Bible says over in the book of uh, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 where we understand it's not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us. Daniel chapter 9 in verse 18 the Bible says, he says, I make my request of you. It says, uh, because uh, ye, it says, are righteous. And it says, and because of your great mercies. You know, as he would go to that which is the king, so can you and I come to the king of kings and we can go to him and say, God, I pray that you would also extend your mercies. Extend your mercies upon my family. I, uh, I've been to several houses where, especially in the Philippines, when I go to the Philippines and they would say, Pastor, I'm glad you're here. Would you come and, uh, to dedicate our home? dedicate our home. I've done that several times here. When people get new homes, they'll call me up and they'll say, would you come and have a dedication service uh, in our new home? And, uh, and of course, we'll read scripture and we'll pray and we dedicate that place to the Lord. Now, can I tell you, watch this if you will, uh, it, but it, it's on people's minds that they want their house to be dedicated yeah. to serving Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, shouldn't that be the way it is in every fabric of life? Yeah. Now, think about it. You get in your car and say, dear God, this is your car, and I dedicate it. There was a day when you didn't have a car. You remember that? I remember I was in Bible college. I, I worked at UPS as I was trying to start my own business at the same time. And, and uh, I worked at UPS, and my brother, my, my older brother, uh, he, uh, he gave me a 12-speed uh, bicycle. And I would ride that 12-speed bicycle over to UPS. And... Uh, and then I would take it around as I was trying to pick up businesses, starting a window washing company. And, and I'd take it around and try and pick up businesses. I remember that. I remember praying on that bike. And I'd invite people to church. And, but nobody would come. Nobody would come. I said, dear God, if you'll give me a car, if you'll give me a car, I promise I'll use my car for you. I, I will, I promise. And God, if you'll give me a car. 
And I'll promise I'll try and get people to church every single week of the world. I promise I will. And God gave me a car. And uh, I was able to use that. And of course, and God gave me several other cars after that because of things happening to that particular car. But can I tell you, uh, that was God's graciousness. Come on. Oh, come on. You, you, you think about this, you'll get excited eventually. Because of God's graciousness, can I tell you, you are highly blessed. My, my dear wife and I, we have uh, three sons, a precious daughter, and all of them serving the Lord. I feel highly blessed. Amen. We have three daughter-in-laws and serving the Lord. I feel highly blessed. We have two grandsons and uh, not serving the Lord because they don't yet know the Lord, but they know how to get things. Amen. We had some of the children over last night, and, uh, and, uh, or night before last, and, and, uh, and boy, I tell you what, little Andrew, little Andrew, you know, he's got his own personality, little Andrew. And it doesn't matter who has food. He wants your food. So one of the daughter-in-laws was sitting there on the floor, and he went up, and he said, please? It was ice cream. Please? Please? And, of course, you're not, you got to give in. I mean, what are you going to do? So the daughter-in-law took a little bit of the ice cream and gave it to Andrew, and he was just so happy, and then it was gone. Please? <laughs> please? Then he went around to somebody else, Brother Davis, please? Please? He had enough pleasing going on. I'm sure he grew at least one pant size. <laughs> but here, a child can do that. Come with me to Cambodia where people live in the trash dump. Yes. Amen. They're saying, please, can I go through the garbage? And they're digging for just a little morsel of bread. We're highly blessed in our country. The other day, Grant had a birthday, and somebody in our church, I don't know who did it, but gave him a whole bowl, whole bowl of a pudding, wasn't it? Wasn't it pudding? Whole bowl of pudding. I had him come to the platform, and I just wanted to make sure he wasn't poisoned. And so I opened up the lid and had him put a finger in and take it right here. At the, and then I said, oh, you're not going to eat that by yourself, are you? He refused to answer. <laughs> Highly blessed. Highly blessed. My wife and I went to Branson for, we took a four-day excursion, and we went to Branson and, uh, and just spent some time together. We love flea markets. You know, I know we're nuts, but we, do, we like them. And so we walk around the flea market, stuff like that. And boy, I'm passing out tracks and, and whatnot. And boy, just people, thank you so much for that. And oh, oh thank you so much for that. And then we, we uh, stopped in that thing. It was called... Uh, 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 well, sight and sound, but we did that, uh, what is it called, a museum, uh, the toy museum. Boy, I hung out there. Woo! Remind me of the good old days when I was younger. And, uh, but we went to the toy museum and was able to uh, talk to the lady that owns the toy museum and her, her son starting a church in Fort Worth and, uh, and just spent some quality time with her and talking and stuff like that. And uh, I was surprised how many people named the name of Christ. But then when I come here to Dallas and we go out soul winning, I'm surprised how many people do not even know that there's a God. Amen. Now, I'm saying we have a job cut out for us. You say, oh, preacher, I like the air condition. Woo! Hey, I like the auditorium. You want to keep it that way? Oh, let's get out the gospel. Amen. Let's tell others about their need of Christ. Let's make sure that we reverence him. Let's make sure that we keep him first in our lives. Let's make sure that we don't just name the name of Christ, but we walk the Christian walk. And let people see Christ in you, the hope of glory. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege to be able to be in